Hello, everybody. Welcome to Care Dangerous Talk. It's your girl, Care Dangerous. We're here for another exciting episode. Man, what is this? Our uh, third show of season two on Never Level TV. Well, today is just like all other shows. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're here to learn and um, have a great time. Um, today's guest is mega producer Sting International. He's responsible for some big hits. It's not a lot of times you get to sit down with a producer who's responsible for 30 million albums being sold and even more. He's worked with some great artists from Shaggy and Reggae to Shaka Khan. Everybody loves her, right? So I won't make you wait any longer. Mr. Sting International, please join me. Hey, what's up? How you doing? Big hugs, baby. Big hugs. <laughs> Uh, did you feel it? Yes, indeed. <laughs> you looking good, brother. You looking good. How you trying feeling? To, trying to be good like you, baby. Oh, I thank you. Okay, look, look, you call and talking smooth. I like that. <laughs> uh, <it is. laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Good. Well, your, your first time on Care Dangerous Talk, what I like to do every show is give my guests their flowers. Can I give you your flowers, sir? I guess so. I'll take a little flowers. Okay. Ain't nothing wrong with that. What you mean? Okay. All right. So sit back, relax, and let me give you your flowers. So I just mm -hmm. want to say, Mr. Steen International, I think I know you for about maybe two years now. I think, I think it's been two years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I remember you invited me to your studio. We had a good old time. You played some records for me. And um, it's funny because I heard your music before, but I never knew quite about you. But that day when I got to uh, come to your studio in New York was such a special day for me. Um, just such a professional guy. And I know one thing about you, you don't play about your records. You don't play about the music. You got the real deal going down there with your, with your music equipment and your whole setup. And, you know, it was so crazy just to see all the plaques on the wall and, and the Grammy you won, and I know you're not into like bragging or boasting, but let me do it for you. But uh, just seeing how dedicated you are to getting a certain sound and even in that one or two days getting a chance to hang out with you, you know, I, I was able to, you know, learn a lot from an industry professional. So uh, just knowing what you put into this music and, um, you know, what you mean to music history, music production, uh, as far as reggae, hip hop, and just songwriting in general. I, it was just a cool experience for me. So that's your flowers. Thank you for what you've done for the game, brother. Thank you very much, you and everybody else, you know. Yes. So I know, Steve, you don't like to do interviews. What's up with that? Well, you know, I'm not trying to be the movie star. I ain't trying to, <clears throat> I'm not trying to be the artist. I just do what I do, make music, <coughs> you know, produce, DJ. Mm -hmm. I still do parties and events, you know, just chill. Over 60 million albums sold and you still just a regular guy. You don't like the fame. You're not, you're not in it for that. I don't even know how many albums. I don't even, I don't even watch that. I just make music, you know, it, music is everlasting. So it, whatever it sell itself. You know, no hype, just music. Absolutely. Life, so, you know? so I want people to know a little bit more about you. So where did you actually grow up at? Was it Jamaica? Was it New York? No, born and raised in Brooklyn. I'm a Brooklyn boy. Crown Heights, Bro Flatbush. Brooklyn. And I knew that. I knew that. Brooklyn. When did you get your first taste of music? Because like you and your you and your studio right now, but I know you, you a major record collector. So... Where did that love for, for this music come in at? I was born into music. My mom's pops, everybody in the family was music people. My Mom, mom's collected records, you know. I had a party family. My family was party people, you know. Mm -hmm. There's always a party. So I grew up from birth around records from day one, you know. Even before I was born, my mom was doing parties. So that, no, that was a long time thing, you know. Was there any particular records when you was young that kind of spoke to you that kind of stick out in your mind? I mean, 
I would say one of the earliest records that I remember playing and actually, because I was playing records from, I was like probably two years old. Mm -hmm. I putting them on a the turntable and playing them. And from the lyrics and the, and the, and the hook lines and stuff, I would remember, or that's actually kind of learn how to read a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like songs like One Ads by the Honeycombs and Groove Me by King Floyd. You know, when you you put two and two together and you can kind of read a little bit, you start to make out what G's are and W's and you, you remember the labels and hot wax and stuff like that. Is So records like that always stay in my mind because these are the records I remember as, as, as far back as I can remember, like two years old of the records you see spinning and, you know, the, the beginning, the very beginning. You know? So we know you today as a, a, not just a music producer, but a DJ, a songwriter. But back in the day, did you start off playing a certain instrument um, to start off knowing that you were able to make uh, records or make beats or? I just, uh, I, I fooled with as many, as many instruments as I could in school. Mm -hmm. It was predominantly drum and bass. You know, I tried clarinet, flute, violin. <laughs> you know, that was all right. But the drum was my groove. I was, I'm not an excellent drummer, but, you know, that's what I did. It's, you know, little school concerts or whatever. It was either drum or bass or both. And, you know, I just dibble dabbled here and there. And in, in instrumentation and stuff like that. I was never, and I still don't, as much as I've played on most of my records, a lot of the instruments, I still won't credit myself to call myself an accomplished musician. I'll leave that to the real musicians who study and build all their life. You know, I just do enough to get the groove recorded. And that's, you know, five, three, three four, five minutes. <laughs> These guys play on stage for hours and years. So I give them the credit as being musicians. I'm just a cat with some instruments that can find a groove. Okay, so that's interesting. So you do you, do you not play the keyboard at all? Yeah, I can play key. I mean, most of the it wasn't me, Angel, Big Up, Boombastic. I can go down the line. All of these records I've predominantly played drum, bass, keys. Mm -hmm. You know, and what I can't play, I will get other musicians to play. You know, guitar riffs. You know, if he wants, you know, solo pianos and stuff like that, I'll get the real musicians to come in. But I can pretty much play what I need to get for the foundation. Well, that's what I want. To, that's what I'm trying to get at because uh, how did you know you had enough talent to where, like, at what point did you say, "Oh, I, I got something here," even though you weren't the best player musically? Um, what happened to make you say that? Oh, I can take this and be professional with it. Let me say, when you grow up in the hood, when you get into a fight, you don't know if you can fight. You throw your hand. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? True. That's the challenge right there. So when you're in the studio and you got to make a track or you need to get some music done, ain't no musician there. You better turn into a musician. Ain't nobody I, sing. Yeah. You pick up the mic, sing some backgrounds. Do it. Like, just, you're right about that. You just had to do it. Yeah, challenge yourself. Do it. Train now, yourself. I, I, every producer that comes on. So I think you kind of said it a little bit in your definition. What's the difference between a beat maker and a producer? A beat maker makes beats. Mm -hmm. You know, you find some drums and a groove, a bass, whatever, you know, you create a beat. Mm -hmm. A producer knows how to, <clears throat> whether if a producer doesn't have to know how to make a beat, a producer doesn't know how to play an instrument. This is what the producer does. He uses his ear. He finds the right musicians. He finds the right person that can do scores mm -hmm. or uh, uh, compositions and whatever. You put the puzzle together and you make a finished product. Not very many people, uh, who, most of the people who make beats don't know how to do that from start to finish, get a production done. Find the right background singers, find the right singers with the right textures. You got to hear it before it's done. And then you also have to allow room for whatever might happen because it's, it may be in here what you want to hear, but somebody else may say something or do something that's even better than what you thought or add to it. And you have to have an open mind enough to say, yeah, that's fire right there. Put that in there. You know, and even if we may not use it later, but put it there, we can always mute it. 
you know, you have to make decisions. You have to take command. You are the captain of the ship for that particular song or project as a producer. So now, you have to, you know, a lot of decision making. So when I see on the album that it says you're a producer and a ranger, what's the difference between that for the people who don't know? What does a ranger do? Well, a ranger arranges the song. You have to know that this is the intro, if there is an intro or not. If it's a chorus is going to come first or if the first verse will come first, then a chorus. If there's a bridge, where to put the bridge. If there's an outro, you you know, you have to arrange the song so that, it, you know, just like you tell a story. You know, you have your introduction, your first paragraph, your ups and downs, how to end the story. Every song you're telling a story somewhat. You mm -hmm. know, it's a, from that first second to the last three and a half minutes, four minutes, nine minutes, whatever the song is, you have to keep the interest of the listener. Mm -hmm. It's arranged properly, as well as produced properly. You can play that song from the beginning or like back in the old days when the song faded, you sing it out to the last riff on the mm -hmm. fade because it's produced right, it's arranged right, and it keeps your interest. So you have to arrange the song. Absolutely. Um, thank you for explaining that to us. Because like I said, we come here to learn. So I just want to kind of simplify things for people that's watching. Um, but I want to take it back because I know not only are you a big music producer, you started off as a DJ. So mm -hmm. I want you to take us back to the start of that because you really did some trailblazing and some big things for reggae music and reggae tone in New York in the um, early 90s. Just tell us a little bit about that and the impact that you had from working in clubs and throwing parties and whatnot. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a disco baby from the disco era. Mm -hmm. Before pop, you know, when you, when you had guys like Grandmaster Flowers, Ron Plummer, <clears throat> Um, these guys were doing disco and R&B and cutting up records in the park before the Cool Herc's. You know, Cool Herc used to come down to Brooklyn and hear these guys play. This is the part they don't talk about. So these guys were setting the trend for what was to become hip hop. It was being wow. done with disco records and beats and breaks. You know, super sperm, dance to drummers beat and all that stuff. Love is a message. Even before that, before these records, they were mixing records on 45 and, and albums before they were 12 inches. So I'm from that era, you know, and then it morphed. Disco eventually turned into house music and stuff like that. But reggae was a part of it because mm -hmm. it was always there as well. But as the music was changing with disco, R&B, uh, I guess the beginning stages of house music, so was the evolution of reggae into early dancehall, which mm -hmm. is late seventies, rockers, before that was rock steady, but then rockers, and then kind of like what what it was to be dubbed as dancehall, early Yellow Man, Josie Wales, stuff like that. And me learning how to play disco, matching the beats, the tempos, mixing, blending, what we would call it, I incorporated that into the reggae, which most wasn't doing. Most guys didn't know how to mix. Mm -hmm. they, would, they would probably throw in on the beat, you know, guys who could play and, and, and program the music, but they weren't really mixing. So I incorporated the disco mix with the reggae. And as time progressed, like we got into like 85, when it's the cut of what we know as Sling Ting came out, which is the real first popular computerized beat, computerized rhythm and reggae. Everything started becoming computerized. So it was mm -hmm. easier to mix those songs. And plus, it was now incorporating a younger demographic. It was, it was cool now. And it was not just Caribbean kids. It was people who grew up in Flatbush. Yeah, because I heard at first they didn't even want you guys to play reggae on the radio or, or didn't get a good reception. No, right? no. No, no. We, we, you, reggae, only reggae that was playing were on off stations like WLIB. Mm hmm uh, WNWK stuff, you couldn't get reggae. It was no, it wasn't even Kiss FM at the time, but you had mm -hmm. BLS. It, uh, LIB was a sister station of WBLS, and that was AM radio. So you had the Caribbean show with Ken Williams and stuff like that. You have guys like Gil Bailey, uh, who were doing the, the real pioneers of music, of radio back then. Mm -hmm. um, so me now, 
coming up, I guess, from the disco era and incorporating that with the reggae, I came up at the right time where things were starting to blossom. Mm -hmm. And you had the, uh, the other guys like DJ Paul, DJ Carlton, uh, who was setting, you know, those, those are the real trailblazers before me. That okay. kind of my way. Clubs like Love People One, Village Hut. You know, when I was a kid, these are the clubs I wanted to go to and play at. And finally, I'm old enough to be in them. Well, not really old enough, but them days you could be in a club. <laughs> and you won't get in trouble. Right. So now I'm at 16, I'm 16 years old, 17. I left home and I'm, you know, I'm playing in the club, Club Illusion, Empire Inn. And it was, I don't know, it was just a natural progress because I used to play at the park, you know, in, in the crib and projects. We did parties, Brownsville. Didn't matter. Wherever the kids were who wanted to party, we was playing. Now, I heard that. Is it true that the parties got so freaking big that you had to pay people to leave? Well, that, that happened at the underground. Okay. That was at the underground. Uh, so, you know, if you fast forward a little bit through the beginning, you know, the, the Empire Inns, Love People, One Village Hut, Act Threes, it kind of morphed into Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, via Ricky Warmington. Uh, who was doing the first parties at Bentley's, who was, you know, these are real R&B clubs, uh, American R&B, Bentley, Silver Shadow, uh, Red Parrot. These clubs were, they, you know, you know, they didn't have reggae or Caribbean music in these clubs. Before you had like a Negril, stuff like that. Very, mm -hmm. very, very few. So now we were reaching more into the avenue of Manhattan, the mm -hmm. light city of you know the glamour so reggae caribbean music is now be, you know being recognized in manhattan so now you had the american kids who weren't exposed to that who maybe weren't from brooklyn who was able to come and listen to reggae at bentley's and at silver shadow and stuff like that so the music was expanding so that growth now opened up the doors for uh a party at latin quarter mm-hmm now, Latin Quarter was the other place where Red Alert used to play on okay. Friday, late Friday night. So the, the reggae party was early Friday night after work from five o'clock and went till it actually was from five, I believe, from five to eight first. And it got so big and it had to extend it from nine, then 10, and then 11. But what happened, it was now clashing because when the Caribbean people were leaving at 11 o'clock, the hip hop kids were online waiting to get in. So there was a clash of cultures hmm. because it was still that, you know, black against black people, y'all coconuts, your Yankees, mm -hmm. but it was there. So there was a clash. So at that particular time, David Levy had just came on the scene. David Levy rocking, you rock. For those who don't know the name, he was in his early stages of, I guess, experimenting with, with, um, promoting Caribbean music, reggae, predominantly. Because mm -hmm. he used to do like the after parties for Michael Jackson and stuff like that. So he had all mm -hmm. the links, Studio 54, Ritz. He was in with those guys. Places we couldn't normally get into. So he had those links. And he actually went to a school to school with another guy named Stan Smith, mm -hmm. who saw the vision and kind of reeled David in. He put two and two together, said, these parties, David, this could be big. So is a you know, is, is a few of people who are the ingredients of kind of like who really made it happen. And the Latin Quarter Party gave way for underground because the Latin Party, the Latin Quarter Party got so big. So long story short, I left um, I wasn't a resident at, at um, Latin Quarters, but mm -hmm. I became resident at Underground. Now Underground, which was uh, called Red Alert played there too at one time. It was called, uh, oh, wow. That's okay. You're giving us a lot of gems. I want to know specifically, yeah. like, what was the atmosphere like? I mean, take us back because, well, I mean, you, it was so many people. Like, what's going on? What kind of stuff going on? Yeah. Well, the underground, let's, you just picture it like this. The underground, <laughs> and I have to start it from here because okay. everything about sound system. This is why the disco was the disco. The disco culture is because of sound system, really. Mm-hmm. Besides fashion and all that shit, if it wasn't for the sound system, forget about it. 
you had Bonds International, you had the Paradise Garage, Studio 54, you had Empire Skating Rink, Love People One. These clubs had uh, the, the craziest sound systems for the time. And it was done, designed by a guy named Richard Long. Richard Long was a sound system designer who actually took concepts from the guys in the street. Um, Grandmaster Flowers, Larry Levan, and put his knowledge and math and all that stuff together and used some designs from the old school and basically designed sound systems that became legendary. And that became the sound of New York, even though they were clubs he did in all over the world, but like Zanzibar and Jersey. Well, Richard Long also did a sound system in the underground. Mm -hmm. Now I'm familiar with these sound systems already as a kid, because I grew up in sound. So by the time I got to the underground, so you imagine this club, huge. I mean, huge. You could put 2,000 people in here comfortably mm -hmm. with the proper sound system. So once the doors opened up, I came in maybe a couple of months after the party started, after the, the I guess, the event began. So, and that was like March of uh, 1987. I think David had first started probably like December mm -hmm. of 86. So by the time I came in, I already had a following. So I brought the following with the crowd that was already there. And with my style of music, my age group, it just started growing. Word got around. It was the right time. You had Americans, you had the Latin community, you had Asians, white people, black people, it didn't matter. It was Manhattan, so it's safe to go to, to party with the reggae because you know reggae is predominantly bad boys and ganja and gunshot it was surprising because i heard you even say because of how the music was um even uh the gay community felt safe coming and partying at these parties uh yeah well the gay community who just come out at that time they weren't like flamboyant at the parties okay was, yeah 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 you know, just keep it low key you ain't okay. to break party and carrying on with that them days you okay. know this wasn't happening. You just come in low key and just hold your corner and have your fun, which everybody did anyway. But that was just the right time. And the thing is, I wasn't just playing reggae. Mm -hmm. I would play reggae, you know, 90% reggae. And then I play house music and then some some hip hop, not no knucklehead shit, because I already, I'm from that. So I wasn't trying to bring that element into the, and destroy the party. Well, when you say the sound system was, uh, was good, what was it about the sound system that was different than any other club? Like, well, explain that to us. Well, first, it, speaker placement mm -hmm. is most This, you know, you cover the area. The dance floor needs to be covered balanced that's evenly. That's number one. You can't put a speaker in this corner or two over here and you have 800 feet of space and you expect people in the back to hear it like the people here in the front is going to be deafening people up front. So it was put properly around the room, all of the full range. You had tweeters in the ceiling, mm -hmm. you had bass all around the club. So it was balanced. Then you also had the boxes. The boxes were all designed properly. They were crossed over. right. So it was pretty, pretty much you stepping into a dance floor into a large headphone. Wow. It, but it wasn't deafening. It was balanced properly. It's, it, loudness is one thing, but distortion is something else. You can have a, a sound system that's this big, and if it's balanced properly, you can crank it, and you can still hear yourself talk without screaming. And you can have a small system, and it's not sufficient, mm -hmm. and it's blaring, blaring, and it's distorted and deafening, and that can fuck up your ears. So it's not about all about volume. It's about distortion and clarity. This sound system was the shit. It was big, <laughs> heavy, it was, clar it was clear. It had clarity. You could hear every note, every instrument. You could hear the separation in the stereo. Everything mattered. And you had full control because you had the crossover, not an isolator. A crossover allows you to control the different parts of the system. You can mm -hmm. have full, you can control the tweeter, which is the top end. <laughs> And then the sub bass. So when you need to pull back on the bass, because every record is recorded different. And that's record, true, yeah. Balance the same. So you sometimes you need to bring up the bass. Sometimes you want to exaggerate and put the bass in their belly, you know? Sometimes you want to tweet it a sizzle. 
but sometimes the record needs to be calm, like in the beginning of the night when people are coming in. It's, it's all about controlling the crowd and the emotions of people. You know, you have the power to do that as a DJ that knows how to program and study people. That's what's missing today. Mm. Not just that, but proper sound systems. So all of this is why the music is so scrambled and, and all over the place today. There's so many elements missing, not just from the nightclub, but actually from the synergy of musicians, producers, arrangers, people in one room making a well, song. What, well, what, what, well, what the hell happened? Because I hear that from a lot of people. What happened with the quality? Uh, is it quality? What happened with that? Um, Your video disappeared. Okay, there you go. This is what happened. The computer. Okay, the computer. <laughs> Put the it computer. in the hands of motherfuckers that don't know what the fuck to do. This is my phone ringing. I just... You know, and it's a good thing and a not so it's always balanced. You know, it's it's great because a lot of kids or people who who never had access to studios or couldn't afford it. Now you have the ability to create, learn. But then it also puts it in the hands of people who are destructive or who are for the quick fly by night, quick buck. Don't give a shit about the culture, the music, the lyrical content that they feed the children. Mm. Yeah, you know I'm saying, and they and then the internet they put out whatever. So you then, you you do have a problem with some of the lyrics and things that you're hearing today, and if so, what exactly do you mean by I, that? Like, I don't have a problem with lyrics because you know, I, I love gunman lyrics. Mm -hmm. I love whatever fun slack. You know, it's how it's, it's how it's done, but it's also balance. Okay. There's no balance. Everything is one-sided now. It's all about guns. Kill a motherfucker, shooting them in the head. This bitch, this whole skin up your body and <laughs> ain't nobody talk. Ain't no love. There's no more. There's no love. There's no more building. There's no more educating. There's no more blackness. There's no togetherness. There's no, it's all division. No, that is true. So you right. just want more and variety in music or diversity. You need variety. Okay. But when you can control people, with music, which is the easiest tool, music and fear. Mm -hmm. And fear, that goes down the channel of basically religion and what we just experienced, a lot of it with COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. Fear based. You control people, you program them. But music, media, uh, other ways to do it. So when you channel uh, lyrical content, emotion, notes, frequency, and you continuously drive negativity in children, especially in their mm -hmm. most purest age, one, two, three, four, five, you're fucking them up for life. Mm -hmm. It's very hard for them to get that negative energy out of the system because this is what they're taught. And if the parents don't curb that or at least balance it, channel it, Look at look at what we're dealing with today. You know, people always say, "Well, this is what the people want to hear." That's and bullshit. That's <laughs> bullshit. This is what the motherfuckers who run the shit, the media, the politicians, the people who own these corporations, they want that okay. because it brings division, it brings hate, it brings crime, it brings animosity against us, each other, black people especially. You know, mm -hmm. black and white, whatever. But they want that because the more we're killing each other, the less they have to do. And, they, and, and, and the less, less education that our children get about economic structure building, whatever's, you know, on the horizon, like crypto and these things that are changing, mm -hmm. goals, long term structure for family, family wealth, uh, discipline. You know what I'm saying? There's no, there's no discipline. Until they took away discipline. I'm not about, I'm not at all uh, with child abuse and shit like that, but there's also balance. You have to mm -hmm. discipline the child. And they have to know from early that when you do things to a certain extent, there are consequences. Mm -hmm. And when children are not taught consequences from the beginning, they're going to grow up not thinking there's any consequences for their actions. And that's when they get to be 9, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And they do all that they do in the street, not realizing 
there's going to be consequences eventually. And you're going to be in the can and thinking about that shit for 12, 15, 18, 20 years, if not the rest of your life. But it all starts from home, starts from early. And these people who control the music, the mm -hmm. Atlantic, the Warner, all the labels, Universal, they know what the fuck they're doing. This is why all these cats who own the media own a radio station. Wall Street owns mm -hmm. these radio stations. It's not independent stations anymore. DJs can't come on and experiment. The Funk Master Flexes and whoever else, they, they, they're told what to play. The morning show, they're told what to play. They have to follow a chart. They can't say, this is a great song. It's not, there's no more Frankie Crockers anymore where he can go to the club and say, this record is a shit. I'm, pl I'm putting this on my show. And break yeah, so, so so all the DJs that's out there saying I'm breaking records, are they lying or are these records being picked by people that's above them? Well, it's 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 deeply woven, interwoven. It's it's record labels and who's mm -hmm. got the money and who's paying who. Because I don't give a fuck what nobody say. All these motherfuckers are taking money. <laughs> payola, payola is every fucking way. Taking money, taking dick, taking whatever. <laughs> whatever. Oh, I you know, said it. Yeah. It, 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 uh, it, you know, in this business, it's always been like that. You know, sexual favors, trade this, trade that, work, work your way up the ladder. That ain't going nowhere. That's Hollywood. That's that's just the way to fucking, you know. But on certain levels, you have the mix show, you know, especially the mix show, because a little bit of freedom in the mix show. So all you got to do is drop it two seconds, you know, a couple of times and you get that bag. So it's who's paying. So now it's all about every DJ that gets on. They, they, well, where I'm going to get the bag from who's paying. Oh yeah. These DJs want to be paid. I mean, so, when I grew up rapping in Atlanta, like I could just go up and talk to a DJ, but now they'll tell you, you got to pay to even talk to me. Yeah. I was just like, yeah. damn, for real. Yeah. So where is the music? Where is, it's not about the music anymore. It's about no, it's not. So when you got these cats who run the shit for 95% telling you, you got to play this and it's all negative shit. And it's the mm -hmm. same three, four, five artists predominantly. Right. Shit over and over. Then you got the little bit that you had left with mix show DJs who had the freedom to program and play whatever, like the red alerts back in the days. You know what I'm saying? Nobody can tell them what to play. You can tell me what to play on Kiss FM. I never, ever in my life took a penny to play no music for nobody. It's either I thought the song worked for the show, for the culture, mm -hmm. and it would help generate and sell records that help the culture, help the artists, you know, overall. And if I didn't think it would work or it's not for my type of short demographic, I wouldn't play it. But you couldn't pay me to play music, not in the club, not on the radio. You can't even pay me to produce a song because if if I don't feel it, I, you cannot hire me, basically. I have to feel it. Mm -hmm. I'll decide to do it. And if whatever money might be involved, but most of the time I don't do it because you're not going to tell me how to channel the music or force me to put some negativity or whatever. You know, I, I'm not I can't be bought. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's important, man. It's like money just take over everything, man. Or, or, or like somebody said, maybe it's the lack of money brings out the evil in people. It's not money, it's the lack of the dollar. I don't know what it is because I'm I ain't about chasing like that. You know, I don't I don't chase money like that. If it's coming to me, it's coming to me and whatever fold. If it's mine, it's mine, you know. But so you're not, not worried about the fame. You're not worried about the money. You just like making music. Yeah, well, I'm making music, living life. You know what I'm saying? But music. don't get it twisted, guys, because he made, he made some money in order to live off the music. He, 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 he's good, but he just saying that that's not his main reason for doing it. Like, Absolutely. you're not going to be bought. That's never been my, my drive. The, the, the drive is not the money from the music. I make yeah. the music. It just happened to work. But even before I was producing, I was playing in all the clubs. I was making good money as a kid. I was straight. Wow. I had duplex apartments. You know, I was good. You know, Man, before you like duplex apartments, you sound yeah, like the Jeffersons. <laughs> you don't yeah. move on up. <laughs> good. You know, I, 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 I'm an innovator. I hustle. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, I like that. You you invent, you reinvent, you know, and I, that was just from DJ. This is long before Shaggy. Yeah. And so I was, you know, and then you had the other cats like Red Fox who brought Shaggy into the camp. You know, we was doing it before. The Shaggy's like like Shaggy is like the silver spoon kid mm -hmm. of all the work that was done before him. You know, so cats like Red Fox, Screechy Dan, these guys that were doing it, these guys in the trenches, Mikey Jarrett, I go down the line of, you know, Shelly Thunder, Peter Metro, you know, is a, is a bunch of them. Weren't were you working the with, sorry to interrupt me, weren't you working with, um, just to go back real quick, with uh, DJ Funk Flex at Kiss? No, Flex, I, that was, Red, uh, Red Alert was at Kiss at the time. Flex was just getting on. He, Flex would fill in. Mm-hmm when red was going out of town so when when red wasn't there flex would be the guy who would fill in at that particular time and then eventually flex went over to hot and that's when flex came flex y'all right. had such a legendary group man did y'all yeah. did y'all know everybody was gonna just blow up and, and like that or yeah we were just all do we did it because we loved it you know what i'm saying i mean we all did different things at that time I know Flex was like working at Profile Records at mm -hmm. the time. I was in the clubs. Uh, I think I had just started a label that time. Or Matt, I might add, I might even before I started the label, but you know, I was just dealing, dibbling, you know, dibbling, dabbling in production at, at those days when I was at the radio station. So it was just all a, a new time, you know. It, we were just doing things. Nobody thought it would be anything like it is today. You know, I just I knew somewhere there would be some kind of greatness at the end of the day, but I didn't know to which magnitude that the music would actually go to, and it's how would it you change, culture, you know, and shape culture even to this very day. But you never know. You, you never know. You just got to keep doing what you love and feel yeah. the vibes. Like I like your whole theme. So you you brought up Shaggy's name, so. Mm. Let's go on and talk about Shaggy. How did you guys, just start back over, how did you guys meet? You said somebody brought him in. Yeah, well, Red Fox is one of the pioneers, New York okay. pioneer dance hall. Fox had two major hits in New York at the time. Fox was basically, you had Shabarank, Supercat, and Red Fox. Mm -hmm. You know, you had other guys too, but these were the guys who were like the New York DJs. Fox was the, more of the New York, New York DJ because he was the younger one and up and rising. He had the streets. Shaba was really from Jamaica. He had moved over this side, but he's Jamaican, Jamaican. Supercat lived in New York for a good while, but he was still considered the Jamaica. You know, he was a little bit older. Mm -hmm. Fox was the new kid on the block who was running shit in the street. He had it locked, you know. I, I promoted him through the underground mm -hmm. and all them days. Uh, big shout out to Peter McKenzie, who actually produced Red Fox's two first big hits down in Jamaica. Bro, 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 bro. <laughs> so I took Fox on and said, all right, I'm going to blow your shit up, bro. I'm going I'm to do this. This is the plan, such and such. And we started doing it, chopping, and it worked. Fox Screechy had a whole Sting International crew. We was doing yeah. shows, Tilden Ballroom, Biltmore. It was crazy. Wow. So just one day, Fox came to me and said, yo, I got this kid. I want you to check him out. Shaggy. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Bring him. <laughs> at that time, I had I was at Church Avenue. You so uh, nonchalant. Like, yeah, whatever. Just, okay. I'll see him yeah, when I see him. <laughs> no, I'm good. Whatever. Had my little reel-to-reel -reel in the crib. DJ set up. You know, I used to record guys like Barrington Levy and them guys at the crib. Uh, so we brought the kid in and I'm like, all right, he's all right. He's cool. No big deal. So what, so that's what, what you thought when you first seen him, like, were you expecting anything? It was just another kid around the way, you know, who on the mic. Okay. You no, know? yeah. All right. He had some, you know, he could ride the rhythm, you know, he was kind of like a copycat because he sounded like major mackerel and some of the other DJs out there already. Mm -hmm. But I thought he was a very good copycat and could maneuver, change his voice. And, you know, so I'm like, OK, that's a skill because I know how to navigate and I know what I can do. Somebody who's, uh, I guess, versatile enough. So 
so it was at the right time that he came into the fold because that's when I started producing heavily, you know. I had just uh, recorded at that time the first two what would be known as reggaeton songs with El General, El General, uh, Tevez Buena, Putuntun. I just recorded those in the studio and it came out and started blowing up. So I was getting more versed into production, okay. even more what I was doing before. So he came in at the right time and just started the label and Fox was running shit. So any big show Fox had, Fox would bring Shaggy, put him on the show. You know, we pushed him to the forefront. Fox basically gave this guy his stage, mm -hmm. pushed him forward. And at that time I did, uh, right around the time I did songs like Big Up, you for Big Up, Big Up, all of them, and then Big Up, and then Mompy, and then a song named Old Carolina. And uh, shout out to Screechy Dan because Old Carolina was actually Screechy's idea. That was a number one single yeah. in yeah. the UK. In the UK. Yeah. So I did Old Carolina and I, there was a, a, a manager, guy that I know from a long time already, Robert Livingston, who was Supercat's manager, who him and Supercat kind of parted ways. And this is when Supercat was on Columbia. So Shaggy got wind of uh, that that had, uh, I guess, broken, you know, those ties were broken and was chasing after Robert to manage him. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know this, but Robert came to me in the studio one day and said, yo, this kid asked me to manage him, blah, 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 yada, yada. And I'm like, bro, I was like, I, ain't, I don't manage. I'm just making records. So if you want to do that, I'll put together a meeting. We, whatever. I don't give a shit. Said, all right, set it up. So I went. Told Shaggy, Robert linked me, said, let's put a meeting together. We met up in Queens. And from that day, we formed a, a label, which was called Big Yard. Mm -hmm. And Big Yard is when we started putting our records. Uh, I had a label already with another guy, Ben Sokoloff, who was the brother of Will Sokoloff, who had sleeping bag records, EPMD, Mantronics, Todd Terry you know, stuff like that. Well, Ben was his brother. We had a label called Signet. Mm -hmm. And that's why I put out Old Carolina and stuff like that. Anyway, Robert saw the potential of Old Carolina because it was an old song from the uh, 60s done by Folks Brothers and Prince Buster that was huge already in the past. Jamaica, England, big record. So he saw the international hit potential of that song and said, I'm going to take this song and blow it up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, do you think <laughs> this is what you do? So we took it, signed it to Green Sleeves. The song blew up in England. Uh, eventually, that project was signed to Virgin Records. Mm -hmm. And that's how Shaggy got on Virgin Records. Now, I got to do this because me and mm -hmm. my brother were the silliest kids growing up. Before mm -hmm. I even knew about you, uh, when I would hear Shaggy song "Boom Bastic," me and my brother, t promise you, we would we would we don't know the words. We would just go "Boom Bastic," semi fantastic touch me on my butt. They got me messed up the room, room, but 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 he never said "but," and I thought he said "but" this whole time, and that's that's totally not the lyrics, right? Yeah, <laughs> "Boom Bastic." Uh, I got stories about "Boom Bastic" too, boy, but. Well, tell them, tell them. I want to know. Boom Bassett can have his third studio album came out in 1995. What, what story you got? Come on now. Well, well, the, the, there's two versions of Boom Bassett. The first okay. version and then uh, the remix version with the Marvin Gaye sample. Mm -hmm. The first version, the beat, the, the concept of the beat was uh, started by Robert Livingston. He, he had a little sample from King Floyd, one of King Floyd's records on the album. So he took it to Raphael Allen. Raphael is a very silent hero in dance hall, New York dance hall. He made beats like the hotness here. You know, hotness here, what am I gonna do? Um, which is actually the foundation. People call it the Dembow foundation of the reggaeton sound. It's really the hotness here. Mm -hmm. His early stuff was Dembow, Yali Good, but the real sound of reggaeton is really the hotness here. And Ralph made that beat. Kuf, Shelly Thunder. I go down the line. He actually did the drums on Big Up for me. Wow. Ralph also did the drums and the sequencing on the original Boombastic beat. 
So they did the beat and then the demo was done, the vocal. And then I heard the demo. I was like, all right, I got it from here. So that's when I started. I put on the extra drums. Mm -hmm. I actually put on the, the keyboard, and now that that piano riff, I kind of borrowed that from um, KRS One. The bridge is over. Yeah, I kind of like took that <laughs> and put that in there, and that's how that sound came about. So that's from hip hop, which that hip hop song came from reggae. Books. Now I can't be the only one you heard throughout the years come up to you and say the words totally wrong, right? Um, I know a lot of people didn't understand the words. <laughs> you know? I wrote them down. It actually goes, I'm boom bastic. Tell me fantastic. Touch me on my back. She says on Mr. Rule, romantic. Call me fantastic. She touched me on my back. She says on Mr. Boom, boom, boom. What? <laughs> Stuff like that. Shout out to Marshall One, because that <laughs> morning came from that's a Marshall One style. Another guy that. But um, so I basically did that. And if you listen to the song carefully, mm -hmm. girl in the background, you know, laughing and giggling and saying stupid shit. Mm -hmm. Sounds like me. <laughs> that, well, that's actually me. <laughs> and how we wind up doing that, uh, I was in a studio with uh, Bridget Dennis Halliburton, who okay. Dennis Halliburton, <laughs> actually another guy responsible for the foundation of the reggaeton sound. So Dennis was one of the engineers at the studio that I learned out of HCNF. Big up, rest in peace, Philip Smart. Dennis was there. I said, Dennis, you need to take this voice for me. So what we did is we slowed the tape down at half speed. Mm -hmm. And then I did a little high pitch on it. And then by the time we put the tape back up to regular speed, it sounded like, not really like a girl, but it was like a cartoonish. Kind of like- I know what you mean, yeah. Kind of like what what's his name did with um I got a man um what's the name K special K um, what's, positive K positive K positive what your man got to do with, do me? with me I got a man I'm not trying to hear that oh, I got right. him. yeah well, that's, that him, that's, that's him doing the girl voice <laughs> oh okay that is okay yeah that's right okay that's, that's a tape trick okay but on Boombastic that's actually me doing the girl voice. Okay, ain't nothing. Look, you gotta do what you gotta do. It, it, ain't no girl in the studio. You better, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You improvise. You know what I'm <laughs> and okay. uh, you know, put a little effects on it, but that's like the boombastic. And then, like I said, I did you know the mix and all that stuff, and the rest of that is history. And then we needed a remix. They needed okay. a girl. So I, I had to do that remix overnight. I did that re the remix of boombastic in like four hours. Wow. Because they needed it. And I had to get it done. So I did it, chopped, blah, 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 one, two, three, and it was ready to go to press. Now, the argument with that record is, you know, this was 12 inches at the time. It wasn't I just put an EP out on the internet. Mm -hmm. It was the A side and a B side. Yeah. And the label is arguing with me mm -hmm. that in the summertime is the hit side. In the I'm like, it was another song called In the Summertime. Oh, okay. the song that was done over Munga Jerry. Cover version of Munga Jerry. And I'm like, nah, man, Boombastic. That's that street shit. That's a hard shit. What y'all talking about? And they ain't want to hit. So I'm like, look, we had to compromise. I'm like, because back in them days when, when the record shops ordered records from the distributors, when you got the sheet of all of the records that were out, you know, it's usually just the A side you see, you know. I love her, blah, 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 bombastic, or whatever the title of the song is, it's only the A side. You're not going to see the B side. Mm -hmm. So when this record takes life, they ain't going to know what to order because it's not the title, it's not the A side. So what record companies or labels would do back in the days, they would do something called a double A side. Mm -hmm. You had an A and an AA. It wasn't a B. So if you think it had two hits, A and double A. This way, both titles would appear on the list, the distribution list. 
So now when the record came out and then boom bastic started happening, the labels, were, uh, the, the record shops are actually able to order boom bastic that was on the AA side. And that was just another one of those, I told you motherfuckers <laughs> moments in record history. Listen to the DJ, you know what I'm saying? I got a feeling you got a lot of those. I told you, motherfucker. <laughs> I go down the line with them shits. <laughs> I know you don't play. Uh, Look, there's a lot of I told you so's the records that didn't work because motherfuckers ain't listening to me. Okay. Now, did you get your education just from doing it? I'm so, I'm guessing because like at that point when they trying to trick you with AAA and BUC and all this, um. Did you already have a lot of um, music business uh, insight in your mind or were you learning as you went? Hands on, learning as I go. Learning from being burnt too. Okay. And you know that, that, tell people how that feels. So we try to give people coping skills. Like when people out here that's getting burnt and they just feeling bad, like how was your emotions when you got burnt on deals? Well, and if life is a bed of roses for you and you're just going to be one of them spoiled ass fucking kids. Okay. You got to get beat up. You got to burn your hand. You got to get in a fight. You got to get scrapes and scabs and bruises if you, you, you know, in order to be tough and survive. You know what I'm saying? So you got to get burnt a little bit. You got to get used and abused and smacked around and to, to get tough. You is know, this, that's do you, you get a little bit, do you get a little bit more beat in the music industry, you think, than choosing some other profession? Or yeah, just entertainment? That, because that's the, 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 that happens a lot because somebody like me now, if you do something fucked up, mm -hmm. all right, go ahead, bro. You're going to get yours. I'm, you know, I'm patient. So, it's all right. <laughs> Damn. Okay. So, but with the music thing, I'm, it's still uh, the, the side of it is kind of like as a creator, you tend, you don't want to be bothered with all that business bullshit because all of the fake motherfuckers and the this and y'all handle that shit. I'm going to make these joints right here. Yeah, but when you allow people mm -hmm. to handle your business, even when you think that they have your best interests at hand, mm -hmm. the opportunity that presents itself for them to dig into your pocket, to, to, to dig into your accolades, mm -hmm. When you allow them to, it's so fucking tempting. And these people who you trust, they just peel a little bit. And then, well, you're not going to miss that. Then they start peeling more and start getting greedy. And they start taking credit or taking funds that is rightfully yours. But you as a creator now, you're not studying the money. Either. And they like when you do that shit because if you ain't studying the money, they're going to take that motherfucker. Mama always said that way you had things from black people put it in a book. Yeah, well, but if you're not taking care of your business, right? Somebody gonna take care of your business for you. That's a good saying. Yes, so you gotta learn the hard way, and eventually realize that if you slip, you slide. You know what I'm saying, and motherfuckers get paid off your shit. But at, by the time that happens, you done lost X amount. But at least it shows you the business, shows you who your real people are. You know what I'm saying? And it just teaches you lessons. You got to learn and it's up to you to apply what you've learned going forward and know that you got to handle your business. Creativity is one thing, but you've got to handle your business. Learn. Study, handle study. your business. Study the book. Study the people. Study body language. You know? And once you master how people behave, because it's all the same shit. A con artist is a con artist. They move the same way pretty much. A liar is a liar. A thief is a thief. An abuser, a pedophile is a pedophile. You know the characteristics of them when you see them. So once you see them, you can see that shit coming from the corner of your eye. So once you see how people move, how their tendencies are, you can spot that a mile away. And when you apply that to your business, you can see the motherfuckers who's coming into your fold, try to friend you up, use you, try to get a come up. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then you can decide how close you want them to get or not but you have to understand the characteristics it's the same thing as anybody even in a relationship if you've been with a man or a woman that's mm -hmm. physically or verbally abusive or don't know how to handle money and finances 
you eventually learn the sign. So if you meet somebody else and they got the same lyrics or mood swings or spending habits, it's your duty to say, oh, this, this looks like- Red alert, red <laughs> alert. So if you're going to allow yourself to fall back into that shit, you know, as like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You can only blame yourself if you allow it to happen over and over again. Bam. Okay, before we run out of time, I got a couple more things to hit you with. Now, let's get the serious business uh, scene. So, okay, we talked about Boom Bastic. Now, we yeah. move on to Shaggy's Hot Shot album. Now, you produce, arrange, perform, co wrote it. I don't know what else you didn't do on the album. You, I mean, you did everything on the album. Hell. I, I, I didn't produce every single track, but I, well, I produced the hits on the album and okay. oversaw, oversaw most of the, the project, you know. Okay, the, well, the hits, that's the, you, okay, you, you right. produced the most important stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't me, Angel. It wasn't me. Was on it. it wasn't me and Angel are the two biggest hits on the album. You know, yeah. whatever sprinkles after, I don't even remember what's on the album. Do but you know how many good. times we just said it wasn't me? We didn't even have a reason to say it. We were just going out the house saying it wasn't me. It wasn't me. <laughs> and both both of those beats I made in my crib in Brooklyn. Big ups to Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Drum, drum, and, drum and bass right in the crib. A little now, bit what of what people may seem surprised to know is you're Jamaican. You you throw all these house parties and you don't even smoke weed. No, I'm no, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. I'm an American, born and raised in Brooklyn. Forget about family roots and this and that. Okay, born, I'm American culture mixed with everything else after that. Okay, I'm a disco baby. I, I, I grew up with everything. I grew up with disco, reggae, doo wop, jazz. Cause my mother doo-wop, collected that. Yeah, R and B. Didn't matter. Calypso. It was about music, slow jams. You know, mm-hmm. the family is a mixed family of family and friends, extended family. So it's all types of cultures I grew up with. So I can't even just say I'm an American. I'm mm-hmm. a, I'm, I'm a product of a melting pot of family and friends. And it's not just music. It's food. It's culture. It's dress. It's you know, as a baby, you hear an accents, but you don't even know that there's differences in ethnicities and islands. You're just growing up amongst people. So there are no real boundaries. So that's one of the blessings that I had. You know what I'm saying? So that helped you musically, huh? Being that way. In in character and everything. I grew up in the projects. And she wasn't no, you know, I didn't grow up with, you know, grass and uh, 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 backyard and shit, you know. Yeah, it's rough out there, man. I'm telling you, I'm glad I I ain't gonna lie, I'm glad I grew up in the South. (laughs) <laughs> in the patio, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Black, Crown Heights, Brownsville. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, hell it, yeah. It, it, I mean, I love it. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, I mean, you got to be in New York when, I mean, stuff was really popping off in music. So you got to be in the heyday. I mean, come on, the stories that you have that you ain't even saying yeah. today on here that you can't even tell. So. Yeah, but no matter how you look at it, if you're in the jungle, you got to survive. You ain't going to get caviar in the fucking jungle. You mm. got to go the fucking lizard and make that shit work. So to, to that, that, be, that might be some rough life to people, but it's survival. And you got to yeah. make your way out of it if you're going to live. So it's the jungle same way. That's some real shit right there. That's why I like you. You do keep it real. You're gonna tell the truth. You you you, you must be relating to me because you blind as hell too. But I I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, you you look, everybody got their stories, their ups and downs, their background, and whatever. It ain't about that, is who are you today? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. What are you doing for the betterment of humankind, blackness, if you're about that. You know what I'm saying? The positiveness, the youth, structure, financial structure. What are you teaching? How do you make it better for the next generation? Or are you just taking away for yourself? Yes. Because I don't give a fuck. Everything is temporary. Everybody have that four o'clock coming when it's time to check the fuck out. So mm-hmm. I don't give a fuck how many 
dollars you got, cars, property, how many bitches you fucked, how many diamonds you done had. That don't mean shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But your kids and the kids' kids, if you want the motherfuckers to live on and things to get better for them, you have to teach them structure, economics, history. If you mm-hmm. don't know your history, who the fuck are you if you don't know yourself? And Man, then, you know, everybody too busy flossing and being living their fucking best life for a fucking in front of a phone. They ain't thinking about their kids or the next generation. Well, you preaching up in here, okay? That's what I'm talking about. You that gotta have, you have to have some kind of purpose. What is your purpose? Flossing, right? Come on, man, fuck out of here with that bullshit. Y'all hear it from the legends? Everybody that come on here, give it to us raw, the straight truth. Uh, that's what this show is about. Now, I, I hate as much as this show is about uplifting black folks. I gotta get to some drama thing. I gotta get to some drama before we get out of here. Now, I just have to say, 6 million U.S. sales, that's six times platinum, 10 million total worldwide sales, a diamond album, that's all from Hot Shot? That's all from It Wasn't Me. <laughs> oh, my God. That's, it's the album, but those are the records that did it. Yeah. And that was back then. That's actually, you know, that's 20. I don't know what it is now. Probably damn near double that by now. Dude, be honest, I remember when these songs came out and they just were playing them over and over. Then he came out with Angel Second. What was going on with you when all this success was going on? I know you're not a flashy dude, but come on, man. Come on. You ain't had no one flashy day because I seen you with your suit on. I know you know how to dress. When you go out, come on. I, I I was always, first of all, I grew up with cars. My pop's a mechanic. I grew up fixing cars. Went to automotive high school. I'm a car guy. Okay. Uh, I always had cars before all of that hype shit came out. You know what I'm saying? Wait, wait, wait. Wait. Suits and clothes yeah. and, gear and cars. That's That was just me. That's, you know. Right. I actually follow in the family footsteps because everybody was sharp back in the days. Right. Clean. That's how clean. we move. It didn't matter yeah. if you had $10 or $10 million. Clean. Got to be clean. Presentation. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You want respect? You better show yourself some respect. So, with the records that came, matter of fact, when it wasn't me came out, I wasn't even DJing. I just fell back. I was just chilling. Cause I, I that was 2000, 2001. I already did, you know, all the reggae club plus shit was changing anyway. So I kind of fell back. Actually, started DJing more so in the. Hey, sk- look at my face. You ain't let you ain't let your nuts hang a little bit when them records dropped out, and you got. I, didn't, I never. Never saw it. Six never time platinum. What you mean you never seen it? Because I didn't go out. I wasn't going to clubs at that time. I didn't see what I was just. I just was chilling. I was on my. Just, you know, I was just chilling. I wasn't going out. My cousin was telling me, "Yo, fucking, she was lighting up the club. Yo, that shit's crazy when that shit come on." I'm like word, I I never saw it. Why? If I, if I Why heard did you that, miss that? Because I I just wasn't going out at the time. I did everything. I did the skating rinks. I did the parties. I did the clubs. What, what am I going to do? Go and sit in the party and, and soak up some glory? Yeah. That ain't me. That ain't me. Okay. So I never really saw the impact on the ground of it wasn't me. I never really saw it in the nightclubs. How it really did. I wasn't playing. I, and if, if I'm not playing music or doing an event, I don't really hang out. You know what I'm saying? Damn, y'all, it, it really wasn't him. You just answered <laughs> the song. It wasn't me. You know, it wasn't you. So I never really saw the direct impact of that. And I didn't really, I didn't listen to the radio. I, I heard it on the radio a few times and Angel, but I was, I'm not a radio listener. So got, uh, uh, now, I, okay, what happened to you and Shaggy? Because Everybody knows that he put out a, a project trying to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Hot Shots. And um, remix. bullshit remix project. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't want to be a part of it because you said it was going to devalue. You thought it would put your legacy at the risk of being devalued. Yeah, because that's I had nothing to do with that production. Now, the idea that idea was our idea from years ago. Mm-hmm. I already started that project. I got 
Rayvon's voices recorded. I got Rick Rock voices done over. I had to have the project done. I had Big Up done over. It, it, it was supposed to be done tastefully and close to the original. It was it was really all of the, the, the strategy of it. After seven years, you can re-record songs. Mm-hmm. Right? If you look back in the days, Sam Cooke recorded over, I'm not saying, like Benny King, he recorded over his records. A lot of people, rec- he's like, why does this guy got a second version of the song when the first one was so dope? Right, you don't need it. It's all about owning your masters. So the idea was to re-record the album as close as the original, to keep the integrity of the song. Mm-hmm. It's up a little bit different so that it is different, technically. And you can market and sell that song, license it, and you own that master now because the song is re-recorded over. Mm-hmm. Nothing is going to change with the splits and the publishing, but now you own the new master. Mm-hmm. And now you can use that for clearance and not give it away to Universal. So it's a strategy that was set years ago. So where are you and Shaggy but, now? Are y'all but, cool now? Nah, fuck that. We ain't cool. When you do grimy shit against the people who built you, I don't fuck with you. Put it in a nutshell. I, and I ain't, I ain't powder coating shit. I ain't putting no icing on this cake. I don't play that shit. Disloyalty, ego, leave that shit. Get, get the fuck out of here with that. So when you bring that I got no I, nothing to talk about, bro. So I had to chop that shit off. So all the people that, because it's 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 always a group or always people that we want to see get back together because they were so great together. So never he can't do he can't apologize. He can't do nothing. Nah, it's just gonna be never nah, ever ever. Especially when your behavior is repetitive. Okay. You know what I'm saying it ain't happening. So just, how did y'all get along when you when you had to work on the album with him and Sting 44876? Um because that's a well, that's a good album. I'll give you a little trick, a little well, not a trick, a secret. And I don't give a fuck what they, they say to others. That album, and if they if they did, they lied to me from the beginning. But when I was asked to record that album, mm-hmm. I was asked, would I produce Sting's album? Okay. So say, yeah, I'll do Sting's album. It was supposed to be Sting's album. So my vision was to record records with Sting and then do various artists on whatever songs might need, you know, a Rihanna, mm-hmm. a Shaq, Red Fox, whatever. A project, a fruitful project. But behind my back, it turned into a deal of it being a Sting and Shaggy album, which I wasn't a fan of, and I was mm-hmm. against that because you know, I keep it a hundred. I ain't want to hear that. I want to hear Shaggy on every fucking Sting record. Who really does? You know, people. Not everybody sounds good on every track and mm-hmm. every song, tone, every key. So, if I'm going to do variety mm-hmm. with Sting, you need different textures, different voices, different mm-hmm. styles. I don't want the same shit over and over. You know what I'm saying? So I wasn't with it. So that started to break away shit at the scene because now you're not doing it for the music. You're doing it for your own ego, your self-benefit. And everybody else who I had in, in mind to put on the album, Red Fox and you know the, the crew, the family who would bring good things to the album, you're shutting them out for your own whatever you want to call it. You know what I'm saying? So and there's other things that went on that was just not cool. And when you're willing to just say, fuck everybody, it's about me, then go let it be about you. So when you people say, when they, when they say, well, Shaggy seemed like a good guy, people that say, he seemed like a good guy. Yeah, whatever. I don't give a fuck about all that. That camera shit. Do that shit for the camera, homie. It's good for the camera. Right. But what you do in real life, that's what matters to me. Mm-hmm. And if you're disloyal, you're greedy, and your ego, and I got no parts here. We can't, we can't do nothing. We can't even be friends, homie. So that ain't that ain't never gonna happen. It will never be no 
great fucking reunion. Bygones be bygones. You guys are back. Fuck that. In real life, it's, it's, it's real life first and music shit after. Decide what you, you want to be homies. You want to be real motherfuckers and do music. We can do that. But when you put your your ego, your greed, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, in front of everything when it's not even necessary. Mm-hmm. Nah, fuck that. Because at the end of the day, you you build relationships over time for your peoples. You have memories. You know what I'm saying? So if you're going to be greedy and isolate yourself from those who you built memories with, you're going to find yourself by yourself. You know? And all you got is the memories from here on out. If, if you're good with that, fine. That's you know. But I like to keep my people. My people who are my people, they still my people from 20, 30, 40 years. My same people. You know what I'm saying? Was this breakdown in a relationship with y'all a shock to you, or did you see this coming? No, no, no. Look, this, this again, signs that are repetitive that you see over and over again. Sometimes we just deal with it. You give it the benefit of the doubt. You do it for the team. You do it for the music. They'll grow out of it. You know, they learn a lesson. But when shit happens over and over and over again, it's like, nah, bro, you're not getting no better. You're getting worse. You know, I don't care. Desperado, whatever. Is it age? You know, what are you afraid about that you have to be so relevant? Mm -hmm. You know, enjoy your success. Let's get the young people, push them motherfuckers forward. Why you hold back the young people? Or just use them to stay afloat. Act like you're gonna help them, but you're just trying to help yourself stay relevant and current. Mm-hmm. So it is that. So it's not, always things the public do, doesn't see, but people in the background. You ain't keep it a hundred. You know what I'm saying? And if yeah. you ain't, 100, I don't, I don't fuck with ninety nine. Keep it a hundred. Okay, that uh, Brooklyn, Bro- Brooklyn. Fuck that, fuck that flaky shit. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna keep it 100 with you at all times because I don't. I, I like to stay loyal, baby. Um, yeah, look, loyal, loyalty is you know people tend to what what is loyalty? And I ain't saying you got to do stupid shit. Loyalty gotta, is simple. Yeah, yeah, well, it depends on who you ask. But people see loyalty as well. You got you got to do for yourself and na 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 na. But you you know you got to do for yourself. You got to do for your family. But that doesn't always mean you got to try to stop a next man from eating. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You say it's on there. Everybody can eat. If it's one piece of bread, where well, you going to sit there and be like, let me just, you know. Yeah. Because we don't heard about a couple of that artists think- that stop records from other artists because they don't want them to get big and whatnot. That's we regular. heard the rumors. That- with some of the biggest names in rap, we go down the line with cats who move like that, and they put on this good face and they business moguls and blah blah blah. They grimy on in, on on the real. They do grimy I'm shit. Dirty. But that's the, the you know America. Well, people forget a lot of these people that made it. They from the street, so they bringing that hustle yeah. over to the industry. So it ain't just the music business. That's business. Oh no, it's for sure. Uh, greed. Greed, 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 greed. Well, look, said you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be working with Shaggy. Who are some of the new artists that you're working with? Because I know you got I, some stuff going on. Look, I never did, I never did the music to be a Timberland and Quincy Jones and work with everybody. I don't give a fuck about all that. Mm-hmm. I work with whoever I feel like working with. I got a but young. You did, you did work with Will Smith though, even though you don't be Quincy. No, Jones. I don't work with. But, you know, we sometimes you get remixes and you get the voices. I just edit the voices and stuff. I didn't work with Will. Okay. I didn't work with Sean Paul. I just got the voices. I chop them up, edit them, put them in the mix. Okay. Happens all the time. So I didn't like sit in the studio with these guys. Even the Vibes Cartel. The Vibes Cartel joint that I did, Tony Kelly made the beat. Not nice. And them guys recorded the vocals in Jamaica, sent it up. I did my edits, chop up compression, mixes, and we put the record out. So a lot of people I've, I've done songs with, but I didn't work with them in, you know, in, in the day and age where you can email vocals and record and, you know, you don't have to work with directly, even Neil, 
I didn't record Neo on the track. He recorded the vocals, sent them. I chopped the motherfuckers up and made a song. Good as I that. Well, yeah, you must know what you're doing because they, they send them to you. What about Shaka Khan I, and Brands and Shit? The, well, no, Shaka Khan actually recorded Shaka Khan. Okay. Yeah, brand new being man, that's just so long ago. I don't even remember that. I, I just remember, you know, I did it. <laughs> I don't even hey, remember. I'm just, throwing, I'm just throwing it out there at you. I actually did record Guru. Okay. You know, rest in peace, Guru. You know, I still have that tape somewhere. But, you know, it's just music. It's, it's no real, I don't do it for a job or for hire. If I find an artist and I think it's worth me investing my time and I can push them forward, which is very few because. Mm-hmm. Is really 10% talent, 90% work ethic. Mm-hmm. A million motherfuckers got talent, but they don't want to work and do what it takes to make it happen. That's that why you true. got, like a Shaggy, who is not nearly as good as, as a DJ as most of these guys, as a, as a rapper, DJ rapper, he can't, he can't touch none of these cats. But in the beginning, he was thirsty enough. He had the work ethic. He was willing to do whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's why he was able to go across a lot quicker because he was willing to work for it. I give that to him. You know I'm saying it has nothing to do with later on and whatever. I give credit where credit is due. But you can be talented. But if you do not put in the work, if you do not do what you have to do, interviews, you have to get up. You have to smile and do shit when you don't want to smile and do shit. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Dedication. If you, if you just throw some seeds in the fucking dirt, you expect you're going to grow a garden? No, you got to tend to it. You got to get in your hand and knees. You got to put the right shit in. You got to give it the space. You got to water. You got to nurture it. That's how you grow. You know what I'm saying? So with artists now, if you're not willing to put in the work, I can't be bothered. I'd meet so many that they just mm-hmm. want it back. They don't understand patience. They don't understand it takes work. It takes money, finances, relationships. It's not easy to build a star if you don't have all of those elements. So Are some, stars not made? Well, <laughs> yeah. You, you have a lot of people out here who are, well, a star is a star is a star, but are they that talented? You know, it boils down to producer music composers writers to get the right song across and you know how you market them and if, if the timing is right you got the capital there's a lot that goes into it you know okay, no so, who, way. so who you pushing these days what can we look forward to from your team? newest upfront artist is Sade. Sade. Sade she's 18 years old from Jamaica born and raised but she sing R&B like a motherfucker people <laughs> aren't, ain't heard the R&B side yet but you want to talk about uh, Alicia Keys, mm-hmm. uh, Aaliyah, it's a little Erica Badu, a little um, Jilly Scott. She got all those elements. Sade, she, her thing is mixed, a mixed blend up. Real R&B. Excellent okay. writing. This ain't no bullshit. Somebody from Jamaica sounds like trying to do R&B. So when she does reggae, she sounds like she's doing reggae. It's just a next level of singing. Mm-hmm. Execution, lyrical content, enunciation. She's like no other. Jamaica ain't seen nobody like this yet. The world ain't seen nobody like this yet. You know what I'm saying? So Sade's her album is dropping on the 23rd of July. Okay. All right. I have three singles with her out already. African Warrior, Strong, Independent, and Beautiful. And a little Afro Beats called Call on My Phone. So that's Sade, S-H-A-D-Y. Go look her up. And the, up. Um, what's out there right now, don't speak no justice to what's coming on the album. Okay. You know, those those are just the wet the beaks while COVID was still on the last leg of lockdown. But oh, yeah. Check. I think I heard that's the artist you sent me to listen to, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice jam. The music I heard oh. was good, guy. Yeah. You know, Sting, he, he going to tell you the truth. So um, I just, you know, I ain't boosting nobody up. <laughs> right. I, and I'm co signing on that. She's wicked. <laughs> um, And I just released a song Friday, a house music song that I did. Back in 2008, everybody been waiting for. I finally released it. It's called Feeling Feeling. No G. Feeling okay. Feeling by Anaya Day. I-N-A-Y-A-D-A-Y. Anaya Day. Feeling Feeling. It's already 
all the top jocks, David Morales, Louis Vega, Jelly Bean, Ultra Nate. It came out last weekend and it's all over the place. It's it's gonna be a, a an anthem. Well, I'm so happy for you. You're still doing music, you finding fresh new talent. And um what else you got going on? Anything else we can see coming from Sting International? Well, I mean, you know, what I do behind the scenes, and there's a, I do a lot of things. I don't talk about it, you know, but there's all kinds of stuff. Investments, you know. I'll get into that in another segment. I ain't gonna release all of my, you know, who want who want some uh, pep talks and you know, come on board and teach you. Oh yeah, you could definitely come back on because we didn't even get to go over all the stuff I want to go through. Can you give me a quick response to why aren't there? Um, why hasn't a female really took over dance hall? At least I heard you say that in one of your interviews. Like, why hasn't a what a female taken over dance hall music? Or am I wrong? Why is that such a hard business for them? Well, you know, you're dealing with a male dominated industry. Mm -hmm. And most women who, I guess, elevate, blow up, unfortunately, uh, they only blow up because of sexuality. Mm -hmm. uh, degradation, you know. It's never really on a, I don't, the industry is fucked up. Yeah, it sucks. Damn it. Yeah. You know, and because there's so many as women that are super talented and better than majority of men. I mean, I don't give a shit if you got titties or not. If your shit is dope, the shit is dope. Male or female. I got titties and my shit dope. <laughs> yeah, right. but I'm just saying, if you're dope, you're dope. But there's a lot yeah. of women want to compare that outright out DJ outperform dudes tenfold. But you know, it's it's climbing up the ladder. Who dick you gonna suck? Who you sleeping with? What oh, you will Lord. put on? You know what I'm saying? And it's when motherfuckers is in control of that <clears throat> and they can stifle your shit. <clears throat> Look, I done seen it firsthand. I ain't gonna mention no names of artists who would come in and think that they're gonna get put on. <clears throat> and then you know the false promises, don't worry, I got you, blah, 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 blah. And then next thing you know, that shit don't go nowhere because it's you don't you don't fell for the okie doke so they go through that a lot so if you can be lucky enough to find a team that is really about you mm -hmm. your talent your ability and is willing to see past the physical just fucking up fucking the artists or whatever you know what i'm saying see what it's a bigger picture than that the music is bigger than us you got to see past that Yes. And be willing to put the artists first up front, their livelihood, their family, what can be done. You know what I'm saying? But it's, you have to find the artists. But it's just tough because, you know, in this game, it's a, it's a whirlpool and a whirlwind of bullshit that women and, look, women and boys, because boys get caught up too, your, sometimes. Or, but they get turned the fuck out you know, let down that. I mean, you can't, you can bring a horse to the water, I'd say, but you can't force him to drink it. But I can't, fit, you know, I don't know how they, you know, I don't know if they drug motherfuckers, these boys or whatever, and turn them out and pick whatever the fuck tricks that they do, but they do it to boys too. So it ain't safe for nobody who's vulnerable, but for women especially, just for them to get in the studio and record, it's tough. Now, and I want to tell people, you said you have to want it, but I want to remind people, always want it, but don't want it too much. It, I always yeah. have some things that you won't do. Yeah, you keep your state. You got to be a soldier in this motherfucker. Be a soldier. You know what I'm now, saying? I ain't saying you can't yeah. for nobody. If you want fuck, fuck. <laughs> if you Just can to fuck, be clear. Yeah, I, I'm all about it. You know, I'm... Who hey, you don't no way. You want to fuck, fuck. And I'm, on, and I'm saying you can't do it. You can't do that. You can't do both. Right. But when you're putting a price tag or a trade off on it, it's not genuine. So how do you expect to have a good synergy? How do you expect to make music that's true? Mm. You know, 
So like I said, if, if you want to deal, deal. Just have an understanding. And don't trade off one for the other. Or when y'all don't agree, now nah, fucking I ain't recording this bitch. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Make it fine. Either you in it for the music. You know. Are you in for some bullshit? Yeah, I can't speak for motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? Boy, now, why, why I got my people on the line before I let you go. Mm. And I said I wasn't going to talk about me. But since you sting international, you don't sell platinum records, you got a Grammy with your name on it. Is it or is it not true? When I came to your recording studio, you said out of your mouth that I rap better than a lot of women that's in the mainstream. Did you not? Did you say that or did you not say that? Hell yeah, I said that. Okay. I ain't bullshit. Okay. I, ain't, okay. I ain't putting no powder on your donut. I keep okay. it one <laughs> Okay, I just want my people to hear because they think I be making stuff up. I think sometimes, like I just, I just wanted them nah, to hear it. I ain't, I ain't looking for no friends. I just keep it one hundred. Okay. And when motherfuckers ain't got it, I'd be like, uh, either you need to work on your shit. Right. Or go sell some shoes. <laughs> okay. And that's a good set way for me to say, y'all, I'm working on that third album. Why well, I got all these fingers up for? I- I'm working on that third album. <laughs> and you third gotta album. Listen. Third, look, third album, look, I don't got to count, but I can rap. Yeah. So third album, the first two albums, Care Dangerous and Care Dangerous uh, 2. So that's out there. So, Sting, thank you so much for bigging me up and telling us about you and the history. Uh, I could definitely have you back again just to talk some shit, man. <laughs> let me let me, just, let me just tell the audience, look, the best investment you can ever make is in yourself. Mm. And I ain't saying everybody's going to be successful at making a rap record or being a basketball player. Find out what your strengths are experiment do more than one thing try things if, if one shit ain't working you can keep chopping at it but try something else that motherfucker ain't working invest in yourself if you're gonna work for somebody you're gonna be working for somebody probably for the rest of your life oh and it's it's miserable invest in yourself period period Boy, I love talking to you. You are your best investment. When it's time to cash out, nobody can't tell you shit. You are your best investment. And don't invest. I learned from from mistakes. Do not sacrifice too much of yourself and invest in somebody else's career. Mm -hmm. You know, you waste a lot of time and resources making somebody else rich. Now, that's true. And, and I'm saying you got to be selfish, but sometimes you have to consider yourself a little more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't be so giving. Don't be so passive like I used to do. Fuck that. Invest and know your worth. Know your worth. Invest in yourself. As I can't say it enough times. Know your worth, don't, guys. Don't take no bullshit. You know no bullshit. Don't well, Steven... No bu- before you go, can you say this is Sting International and you're watching Kara Dangerous Talk? This is Sting International and you're watching Kara Dangerous Talk. Ooh, I like. Ooh, boy, you you don't you don't want sexy on us. <laughs> I, I, I do radio. I was on Kiss FM. I forgot. I forgot. No, lick the lip. Hey, and say if uh, one more. Say this is Sting International and you're listening to Kara Dangerous Talk. This is Sting International and you're listening to Kara Dangerous Talk. WVLS in New York. Hell yeah. All right, bro. I got another show at nine o'clock, so I'm going to get off of here. Uh, But thank you so much. I can't wait to see you again when I come to New York. You're going to have to let me come by the studio for real, for real. Uh, How long ago you been saying that? Look, look, you know what? Hey, drop him off a call. Drop him off. All right, I'm, I'm going to give you a song. I'm going to sign off with a song just for you. You better okay. start using use this for your um, use this for your outro, your intro. He you know he's going to charge me for the outro. <laughs> All the dance hall kids from the 80s and 90s. Zoop, 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 zoop. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yay. Y'all make sure you join me on my IG live at nine o'clock. I'm going on with popular YouTuber 
Ron Per the second at nine o'clock. We're talking about Bill Cosby and more hot topics. Bill, big up, Bill. Boom, boom. All right, Stan, you take care of yourself, and we can't wait to hear more from your artists. I'm a holler. Sade, 2021, July 23rd. Boom.